Kokomo Friday and welcome into Fantasy Baseball Today presented by Line and Kugels. More on their great variety of beverages later on in the podcast. September 3rd, Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White, who is back home. Looking good. The couch is in place. How's it going, Scott? It's lovely, Frank. I got the two monitors set up again instead of the tiny laptop monitor. It felt very confined, you know. Um, got my nice uh, seaside painting over here done my done by my it is painted by my grandmother-in-law by the way all right so, you know this isn't this isn't uh you know this has some sentimental value to it it's not just it's not just some uh department store art that we stuck on the wall there for all the haters yeah so scott i actually drew this Derek jeter on my wall too i don't know if you can tell but i'm i'm pretty <laughs> 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 uh, today on the podcast we are here to get you ready for week 24 we know that those head-to-head -head playoffs are rapidly approaching some people might even be starting their head-to-head -head playoffs next week final month in roto too so it's a very big month two-star pitchers are we starting aaron nola next week he's got two starts but he's been pretty Pretty bad. Logan Webb continues to crush it. We'll answer some of your questions and more. Let's get things started. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, my good goodness gracious. All right, Scott. Kick us off. Well, I know it's easy to just do the stud pitcher of the day, and I did carrot. <laughs> carrot. That, that's one of my favorite spoonerisms, by the way. Carrot goal. I did Garrett Cole yesterday. I'm going to do... Somebody who's trying his best to 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 live up to Garrett Cole, especially lately, and that is Logan Webb. Logan Webb just keeps getting better and better. He had a 10 strikeout game against the Brewers, who they're not such a bad offense anymore. They they've they've risen to the middle of the pack in in team OPS after being a bottom feeder for much of the year. So you know that that's not a cupcake matchup anymore. He struck out ten and in seven innings, allowing one earned run, twenty one swinging strikes. Logan Webb had against the Brewers. If he's going to be this kind of bat misser, and, and on top of being one of the best ground ball generators in baseball, I, I'm uh, that he could be an ace. Like he could, the upside could be that high. And Eight starts now. His last eight starts, all of them quality starts. Logan Webb has a 140 ERA, a .9 whip, and nearly 10 strikeouts per nine innings. So he's suddenly looking like not even a, not even an average strikeout pitcher, like an above average strikeout pitcher with that amazing ground ball rate. And like, there aren't many pitchers I have more trust in right now than Logan Webb. Like, it feels like he's somebody that you just need to lock into your lineup regardless of matchups and uh, and 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 ride it out for the rest of the season. And if, if it continues to go this well, I mean, we might be talking about him as a top 30 pitcher heading into next year. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up because that's something that I was thinking about. And, and we'll get into this a little bit more because I have a few other starting pitchers that I want to compare him to. And, you know, as we go further into September, of course, we're going to continue to talk about everything that's happening day in and day out. And we'll help you obviously win your leagues. But we're going to put a little bit of focus on things for next year as well. And I think Logan Webb is going to be very interesting to try and rank for next year, given this recent string of success that he's going through. And you mentioned his last eight starts, which are all quality starts. But if you also take it back to just when he returned to the rotation, which was back on July 9th, and a few of these starts he was limited. He went three, four innings in his first two, and then five. It's a 1.57 ERA over his last 11 starts since rejoining the rotation. So the ability to miss bats, get ground balls, and have really good control, not walk anybody, 
I mean, that's that's everything. That's everything we want from a starting pitcher, which you obviously touched on, Scott. So I moved him up to SP25, which is probably really aggressive this time of year, but he's just behind Max Fried and Framber Valdez for me, which puts him in must-start territory, as you mentioned. Where do, let me see where I have him, because I've been working on my rankings. It's kind of been a never-ending project this week. Um, well, I have him 31 right now. Come on, Scott. It, it feels low. Up. It feels low based on what I like. So let's 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 talk this out because I think some comparisons here would be useful to the audience. It's got to be ahead of Zach Greinke now, right? Has to be. Yeah. Um, I'd put him ahead of Marcus Stroman. Yep. I'd put him ahead of Lance McCullers. Yeah. We put him ahead of Max Fried and Frankie Montas. I think I draw the line there. Yeah, so I moved Montas as well up to SP20. Yeah, yeah I got him at 23. <laughs> it's also very aggressive, but I have Montas at 20, Blake Snell at 21. I kind of I threw Darvish in at 22 as like a placeholder for now because I don't really know what to do with him. But then I have Valdez at 23, Freed at 24. Eh, Freed should probably be ahead of Valdez, but whatever. They're very similar pitchers in my opinion. Uh, and then I have Logan Webb at 25. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like Webb has to be. I, I have Webb behind Freed, but I think he definitely has to be ahead of Valdez. Uh, Valdez is pitching very well, also. Yeah, but not he's as, not as good as he could. He could, you know, he could he could pop out this six walk game. You know, I'm I'm not saying Framber Valdez is bad. I'm I'm a big Framber Valdez guy, but Logan Webb is like a better version of him. Yes. So you mentioned must start. I mentioned must start. He's at Colorado next week, so we're really putting this to the test. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, he's at Colorado next week. I, I still don't think he can sit him. Yeah, I'm with you. That's famous last words, I know, but I still don't think you can. Yep. Uh, so I was going to compare Logan Webb to Fre uh, Frankie Montas and Shane McClanahan. These three who I think could be league-winning starting pitchers. I mean, just the way that they're going right now. Frankie Montas, another quality start on Thursday. Six and two-thirds, three runs, seven strikeouts. He wasn't as sharp as he has been recently. He still had 16 swinging strikes on 103 pitches. And Montas now has at least 14 swinging strikes in 10 straight starts, which is just an unbelievable accomplishment. So he is on fire yeah. right now as well. Uh, he's I believe his easy ERA is barely over two during that stretch. Yes. And, and I know that I made some comparisons recently and I looked into that. I didn't compare it today. I didn't look into over the overall numbers, but his swinging strike rate leading into today his last nine starts basically was the best in baseball. It was ahead of Max Scherzer. His, oh yeah. I mean, he's yeah, he's been ridiculous. Yeah. Frankie Montas. I, I mean, I'm sure it would be behind DeGrom if DeGrom had been pitching during that time. He's, he kind of stands alone. Yeah. With a, somebody who can get 20, a 20% 20 swinging strike rate. But yeah, Frankie Montas is in the nine starts leading into today's his, his swinging strike rate was around 18%. So, you know, not that far behind what you'd yeah. see from DeGrom. And, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of it's been the splitter, which was his, his breakthrough pitch two years ago. It's, it's gotten, a, it's been responsible for a lot of those swing strikes, but it's not like that's all he has. It's, it just seems like when he has that, everything plays up. Right. And it, he didn't even throw it as, as much in, in this start on Thursday. He, it was his fourth most thrown pitch. Still threw it 20% of the time, but he threw, there were three other pitches that he threw more than the splitter. We've seen some starts during this stretch where Montas's most used pitch was the splitter. So he's got everything working right now. And, uh, it's nice to see. It's nice to see. Definitely think of him as an ace at this point as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned it, it plays up. Everything else plays up when he has that splitter. I mean, he throws two different fastballs, the four seam, the sinker. He's got a slider that he uses as well. So, I mean, it's it's a pretty legit pitch mix. So, yeah, I'm in on Frankie Montas. Must start. He's home against the White Sox next week. Keep him in your lineups. And then Shane McClanahan is the other one who he wasn't as good as the uh, these other two guys on Thursday. Five innings, four runs, eight strikeouts to two walks. But I mean, I was pretty impressed by... He clearly didn't have his best stuff in this start, and he's going up against one of the better lineups in baseball in the Red Sox, and he still finds a way to get through five innings, give you eight strikeouts. He had 19 swinging strikes on 88 pitches, and in his previous eight starts before this one, McClanahan had a 2.84 ERA, 10.4 K per nine. So, I mean, 
I think it's going to be interesting, Scott, to try and rank these three starting pitchers going into next year. Montas, Logan Webb, and McClanahan, because yeah, I'm going to be very excited about all three. And the problem, the problem specifically for McClanahan is that I know the Rays are going to go deep in the into the playoffs, so he's going to get all this national exposure, and I could just see Randy Rosarena all over again, right? Like, McClanahan's well, he is just going to skyrocket, assuming that he performs well, but... Oh, uh, Ar- 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 Rosarena's playoff performance was historic. Sure. So, I mean, let's not put the cart before the horse. I mean, McClanahan might not do very well in the playoffs, and then, and, and then it won't be an issue. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> well, for multiple reasons, obviously Yankees, but I, I mean, yeah, he, he hasn't. We we see the upside, obviously. I, one of the one of the things I loved about this start, you know, the breakdown of the swinging strike: seven on the fastball, five on the slider, seven on the curveball. That is to get five plus on three different pitches as a rookie uh, who throws as hard as he does. He's a left-hander. I mean, that's. That says a lot right there. Um, and obviously the performance, uh, the line wasn't great, eight hits. They were all singles. Average exit velocity was 85.4. He pitched much, much better than his final line. And uh, and, and the upside appears to be enormous for McClanahan. And, and yet you look at the stat line for the season and it's, it's pretty good. It doesn't blow you away. So there will certainly be a breakout case for him next year. He, he might be that that pitcher that's on everybody's breakout list and gets yep. and gets pushed pretty high in drafts as a result. But he might not be. We'll see. I I could see it being like two years ago where everybody was on was it two years ago or was it last year? I actually I think it was last two year. Two years ago I feel like everyone was on Shane Bieber. Yes. Last year it was Zach Gallon. Everybody was on Zach Gallon and he, you know, he had his breakout season. He wound wound up as a top 20 starting pitcher being drafted, well, before his injury in, in spring training. But everybody was on Zach Allen last year. I could see McClanahan being that player uh, for us next season. Someone asked me on Twitter how high, you know, I'm going to rank him. And uh, I mean, it's, it's really too early to say, but I was thinking like 25 to 30 range, but that's just like off the top of my head for now. Uh, we'll yeah, see what happens. It might, it might be tough. Yeah. Certainly he has that kind of upside, but it might be tough. There's just... There's a lot of good pitchers. Do you still start him at Boston next week? Shame yeah. Um, well, I said that too quickly. I I mean, it it kind of depends how deep your pitching staff is. I wouldn't be scared away by the matchup, I think, is probably the most succinct way of putting it. All right, we just talked about a bunch of pitchers. We're going to talk about one more. My oh my goodness gracious player from Thursday is Tristan McKenzie, who made his return to the mound. He was at the Royals six innings. Only two hits, and we talked about how few hits he gives up. One earned run, one walk, six strikeouts. He had nine swinging strikes on 76 pitches. The velocity rain remained up for Tristan McKenzie in this start. Nine starts since the beginning of July, basically when he re-entered the rotation. 3.27 ERA, 54 strikeouts to just nine walks, over 55 innings pitched for Tristan McKenzie. And on the season... He has a 173 batting average against. To put that in perspective, Max Scherzer leads all qualified starting pitchers with a 180 batting average against. So Tristan McKenzie, you know, he doesn't qualify. He, you know, he's only thrown, what is it, 97 and a third this year, but he has a 173 batting average against. Scott, I have a little bit of a trivia question for you. Okie dokie. Would you like to guess? Well, you don't really have a choice. You have to guess. But guess Tristan McKenzie's expected batting average this season. The actual batting average is 173. Well, the expected batting average, I presume, would be higher. Let's say 220. 220. You're not far off. 207. That's still really wow. good. 207 expected yeah. batting average for McKenzie. He is, I believe it's 79% rostered. So he's probably rostered already in your league, maybe some, some shallower leagues, but uh, not as excited about him as those other pitchers we mentioned, but still pretty damn excited. Yeah, and so I gave you the comparison last year between last year and this year. Yesterday, I gave the comparison between last year and this year for McKenzie's hits per nine, which was 5.7 for each year. That was prior to this two-hit performance on Thursday. Obviously, uh, his 
batting average against last year. If I can find him, I'm not being, I'm not finding it. I have his overall batting average, Scott, in the majors 130 and a third innings pitched, 175 batting average against. Yeah. So it was even lower last year. And, you know, he didn't pitch that much, but it was even lower. So to put it another way, four of his nine starts since returning from the minors, he's allowed two hits or fewer. That's, you know, and there and there were some before he got sent to the minors where he allowed two hits or fewer, but they were also short because he was walking so many guys. It's not even worth getting into those. But yeah, he's among other things really hard to hit, and uh, certainly seems like he's on an ace trajectory too. And it's well behind Logan Webb. He's behind Shane McClanahan too, I think, in terms of trust level. But if if there's anywhere where Tristan McKenzie's, if there are any leagues where he's still available. I think you got to remedy that. Yes. And uh, part of the reason why he gives up so few hits is he gives up a lot of fly balls, which we, we talked about before with Josiah Gray, where you can live with giving up fly balls and even home runs, as, assuming that you're not walking too many batters. And through this recent nine-star stretch, he's not really walking any. He only has nine walks over nine starts. So that, that's really good. That'll get it done, uh, even with allowing as many fly balls as Tristan McKenzie does. Before we hit the news and notes, I just want to remind everybody that starting next week, we are moving to three podcasts per week for the rest of the season. You'll have a podcast in your feed Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. We'll still be live on YouTube Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights. We really, really do appreciate all all of your support this season and hope that you stick around with Scott and me as we close the season out strong. News and notes, Ozzie Albies has now missed two straight games after fouling that ball off of his knee on Tuesday. He had to be carried off the field by his teammates. He was originally expected to play on Thursday, uh, but did not make it back. So hopefully he returns for the weekend because I would love some Ozzie Albies in Coors Field. I mean, why not, right? Uh, yeah. Max Scherzer did leave Thursday's start uh, after just 76 pitches due to hamstring tightness. And when asked about it after last night's game, he said, quote, in the past, I've always been able to make my next start. And I definitely think I'll be able to make my next start. So let's get getting older, news. Max, You're getting older. He is indeed. He's, he lines up for two starts. So hopefully, hopefully he does. Yep. After missing two days with an ankle injury, JT Real Muto returned to the lineup on Thursday. He finished one for four with two runs scored. Wander Franco left Thursday's game with a headache, but he did manage a walk in his three plate appearances. So that extends his on-base streak to 33 games. Wander Franco is awesome. Avisael Garcia exited Thursday's game due to back and hamstring tightness. Glaber Torres left his rehab game after getting hit by a pitch, but later reported that everything is fine. And if that's the case, they originally said that he's going to be back on Friday. So... I mean, I don't know that he's going to play every day when he returns because the Yankees have all this depth and they like to move guys around and, and give players days off. But Andrew Velasquez has played really well for them. DJ LeMahieu has still been kind of meh. Tyler Wade's been very good. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't I don't know that Glaber Torres is going to play every day when he returns. Cabrian Hayes has missed three games in a row due to a blister on his hand. Wilmer Flores was placed on the IL with a left hamstring strain. Kyle Freeland received an injection to alleviate inflammation in his hip on Thursday and is expected to be ready for his next turn in the rotation. Brett Anderson was placed in the IL with a left shoulder contusion. Zach Thompson has been moved to the bullpen for the Marlins, so it looks like Edward Cabrera's role is safe for now. The Prospect Report, currently live on the site. You know that Scott writes it every week, and it is there every Thursday. Five on the verge of making it to the bigs. Well, these are the five most likely to give you production this year. They're the, they're the five most worth stashing, I would say. A combination of proximity and impact. Yes, that's a much easier way to say it rather than that word salad I was trying to get out. Bobby Witt with the Royals, Jose Miranda with the Twins, Seth Beer with the Diamondbacks, Vidal Brujan with Tampa Bay. Those are all names that we've talked about quite a bit before. One that we haven't talked a lot about, newcomer Shane Boz to the five on the verge this season in the minors has a 2.13 ERA, 0 0.80 whip. And uh, man, I, lots of strikeouts this season. Very dominant, 22% rostered currently on CBS. And Scott, you think that there's a chance that he's called up in September? I'm saying there's a chance. Yes. Shane Boz 
you know, he's he's been for a couple years now considered among the best pitching prospects just in terms of pure stuff, but he's really harnessed it this year, throws a lot more strikes with it, and has emerged as arguably the best pitching prospect as a result. I think I would personally put Grayson Rodriguez ahead of him, but th- those are the two kind of vying for that top, th- that best pitching prospect spot. Uh, and the way the Rays have handled him, they basically shut him down for a month before bringing him back three turns ago. And then he, he went five innings in his most recent outing, uh, his, his third start back. And I think five innings is the most he's gone all year. Uh, so like, why would you, why would you bother to shut a guy down like that? Who's already had a successful season developmentally. Why would you bother bringing him back why would you why would you bother building him back up again if you weren't planning on in- incorporating him into your postseason plans they they have the best record in the al the rays do and yet they don't have great rotation options it's mcclanahan's their ace and and luis patino might be their number two I- exciting young pitchers but neither uh you, you know cl- clearly it's not the kind it, it's not it's not what you'd consider a playoff caliber rotation. Shane Boz, obviously, you know, it's it's asking him a lot to come up and, and be an impact pitcher on a postseason roster, but that may be their best hope, you know? And they did it with David Price the first year they made the World Series back in 2007, I believe it was. Um, Price came in as a reliever that year. He debuted as a reliever, but, you know, kind of a multi-inning guy. And I don't know that Shane Boz would be used as a traditional starter if he got called up. He might be a bulk reliever following an opener or something like that. But in that role, if if he meets his potential right away, he could still be impactful in fantasy. So I'm not saying it's a huge priority to stash him. None of these guys are a huge priority to stash in redraft leagues. But if you want prospects to stash, I, I think Shane Boz is among them at this point. Yeah, I agree with you that it could be some kind of piggyback situation. Maybe it's Shane Boz and Drew Rasmussen, something like that, or Shane Boz and Chris Archer. They have three innings each, four innings each, whatever they want to do there uh, between those two. But I, I could see that being the most likely outcome here if he were called up by Tampa Bay. So keep that in mind. I don't know that he'll have much value in head-to-head points leagues, but if he gets called up, can he give you some ratios and strikeouts? Yeah, I think that's definitely possible in a categories league for Shane Boz. Five- that was 2008 for Price, not 2007. Sorry. Correction. <laughs> Small correction. I, I do appreciate your uh, allegiance to being correct, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Getting everything on point there. Uh, five prospects that are on the periphery. Cleveland outfielder Oscar Gonzalez. Mariners starting pitcher Matt Brash, who, by the way, I don't know if he's on the CBS site, Scott. So we got to figure that out because uh, yeah, whenever I, whenever I read this there. article, whenever I read this article, I, I search all of them in your dynasty league just to see like who's available. So it's completely honest. It's it's. I wish there was a simpler process for getting these guys in the database. <laughs> I I pass them on to someone who sometimes has the ability to add them <laughs> when, I, when I write about them and find they're not in the database. So I. I'm trying, but uh, yeah, um, it doesn't surprise me to hear Matt Brash isn't in the database. And I don't think Vinny Pasquantino, Royals first baseman, is either. Oh, he is. He is. In- oh, he is. Yeah. Okay, so it, it eventually came through because I think that was a request from a few weeks ago. All right, good. Nice. Yes, because <laughs> I, I know because I threw him on the scout team tonight when I was <laughs> making the rundown. So awesome name to A-plus name. Vinny Pasquantino. Love that. Uh, Royals first base prospect. Dodgers shortstop prospect, Eddie's Leonard, also five on the periphery. And then the last name here, Baltimore Orioles third baseman, Kobe Mayo. Again, you can find Scott's article currently live on the site. I I do want to mention a couple of these guys if I can. Sure. Matt Brash in the Mariners organization might have the best slider in in the minor leagues. Mm. It's a devastating pitch, and uh, he's been getting a lot of strikeouts lately. So that's definitely a name to keep an eye on. And, and Vinny Pasquantino, not 
not somebody you're going to see ranked high on many traditional lists because he's got the limited defensive profile, strictly a first baseman. And the Royals first baseman of the future is obviously Nick Prado at this point. You know, maybe it could be a Billy Butler or a Cosmer situation where one of them's playing DH, but then they got them MJ Melendez, Salvador Perez issue to contend with too. So we'll see, but Mm -hmm. Despite the lack of prospect hype for Pasquantino, very interesting numbers at double A. And he's actually older than Prado, too. Um, About as many extra base hits as strikeouts and also about as many walks as strikeouts. Wow. For Vinny Pasquantino. All right. A name to remember there in your dynasty leagues. I'm looking up these numbers for Matt Brash. He has 131 strikeouts in 86 and a third innings pitch in the minors this year. So... The strikeout stuff is ridiculous for him. Mariners fans, I'm telling you, the time is coming. <laughs> you have all these prospects, George Kirby, Emerson Hancock, uh, Hancock, Julio Rodriguez. I mean, gosh. You know, they, they got Matt Brash last year from the Padres for Taylor Williams. You remember Taylor Williams, who was a bad closer <laughs> in, in, a, in a very short season? That's oh. who the Mariners got for him, Matt Brash. Job well done by the Seattle Mariners there. Yeah. All right, let's get people ready for next week. The Week 24 Pitcher and Hitter Planners presented by Line and Kugels, and we're going to tag team this one together, Scott. We'll figure things out here on the fly. Scheduling for next week, we have two teams with five games. That includes the Diamondbacks and the Padres. We have 16 teams with six games next week, 10 teams with seven games, and two teams that have eight games next week. That includes the Orioles and the Blue Jays. I do just want to quickly talk about these two teams with five games, uh, D-backs and Padres, for me, must start on the Diamondbacks. It's really just Cattell Marte, right? Josh Rojas, five-game week. You don't necessarily have to start him, right? In a five-game week? No, I wouldn't be. Yeah, I, I think Cattell Marte is the only Diamondbacks player that uh, that would be widely started. Yeah. Okay, and the other team there is the Padres. Obviously, they have some superstars there with... Fernando Tatis and Manny Machado. I would throw Jake Cronenworth in that conversation as a yeah. must-start player. So the thing is, the Diamondbacks matchups aren't so bad, even though it's five games. The Padres legitimately are. They're five-game week, and they're scheduled to face Bueller and Scherzer in that week. Jeez. But yeah, guys like Machado, uh, Tatis, Cronenworth. I, I would say they're too high end to sit, but at the same time. I doubt you'd be starting any of the others unless it's a very deep league. All right, let's go on some pitching here, Scott. Two start pitchers for next week. Who you got? Well, it's a bad week if you're looking to pick up a two start pitcher off the waiver wire. For our purposes, that means rostered in less than 80% of CBS Sports Leagues. The list is two that I'd be willing to recommend on some level. And one of them is Kyle Freeland, who left his last start with an injury and sounds like he's going to make his next start, but who knows? You know, it, it may not, it may change the alignment so that he's not in line for two starts. Plus, you know, he could suffer a setback or whatever. So it's risky, even him. But he, he gets the Giants at home and then he visits the Phillies. So, you know, I don't feel great about that one. That might be a, a points league only wreck. But Bailey Ober who's only 32% rostered is at Cleveland and versus Kansas city. And, uh, we like the way he's been trending lately. So that looks like by far the most attractive waiver wire pickup among two star pitchers. Um, we're going to get into Aaron Nola later, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll save that for later. I'll save that for later. Uh, maybe some questionables like John means versus the Royals versus the blue Jays. Uh, that's probably a points league. Only one you got Hyunjin Ryu at the Yankees at Baltimore. Good matchup and a bad matchup. Probably yes to that one. And you say Kikuchi the same at Houston versus Arizona. Nice bounce back start for him last time. That good, that, that Arizona matchup in a two star week, I think makes Kikuchi worth using across the board. Oh, McKinsey. Is McKinsey's roster rate over 80% now? He is 79%. Yeah, it's I, I don't I don't know that I can call him a sleeper, but he's going against the twins and going against the Brewers. So that's 
you'd pretty much be starting him across the board as well. Keep an eye on Jackson Kawar as well, because we were talking beforehand, Scott, and the Royals are, are they're kind of figuring out their starting rotation for this weekend. So there's a chance that Kawar starts on Monday. Chris Bubich pitched out of the bullpen on Thursday. So it seems like they're going back to a traditional five-man rotation. And if that's the case, it looks like Kawar could have two starts next week. So we're not saying that yeah. for sure, but pay attention to how they shuffle things this weekend. Uh, it, there's it, a chance. Even if it is just one start, it would be at Baltimore yep. for Kawar. So yeah, I'd probably like him more as a than than Kyle Freeland to pick up given given the health concerns for Freeland. 100% with you on Billy Ober, by the way. Eight starts since being recalled. 2.81 ERA, 1.08 whip, right around a strikeout per inning for Bailey Ober. Any other single start streamers, Scott, that you have for next week? Sure. Let's see how Glenn Otto's second start goes this weekend. But... Um, Wait, who's... Yeah. <laughs> Might be worth uh, dialing up 1-800-GLEN-AUTO. 1-800-GLEN-AUTO. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Pick up the phone. The call is free. Yep. <laughs> That's the one. That Glenn Auto. Glenn Auto at Arizona is who he's in line to face next week. So let's see how it goes this weekend. But if it goes well, that's a good matchup. Jesus Lazardo against the Mets. We haven't seen him pitch yet since that turnaround start, have we? Nope. So we'll, we'll need to monitor him over the weekend as well. But if that goes well, like the matchup against the Mets. Luis Patino at the Tigers. That's pretty good. Tarek Skubal at the Pirates. Feels like that's a must. And, uh, well, Joe Ryan is at Cleveland. Ranger. Oh, okay. Ranger Suarez against the Rockies. Like, R Ranger Suarez is apparently just going to become a fixture on this list. <laughs> the way, uh, who was it earlier in the year that was always on the sleeper pit? It was JT Brubaker. Okay. Right. Ranger Suarez is better than JT Brubaker. We and hope. You, you'll want to start him against the Rockies. Now, I, I feel confident saying that. Uh, by the way, on Ranger Suarez, if I looked at the schedule correctly, that will be the first game out of Coors Field. And we know that that game, usually the Rockies bats kind of lag a little bit. So uh, that makes that matchup even more exciting for Ranger Suarez. I have a few names here. It's got some single star streamers for next week that I'm going to throw your way. Uh, probably more so for deeper leagues. But uh, you let me know what you think. Adrian Hauser at Cleveland. I want I want to do it. How about Daniel Lynch at Baltimore? Mm, you know, mm, I don't have that one on here. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, that, it it is it is difficult to try and figure out the Royals' rotation right now. So that is, that is true. Um, but if he's actually starting against Baltimore or at Baltimore, I guess it would be. Then yeah, I, I would call him a one start sleeper. Daniel Lynch. All right. You mentioned Glenn Otto. Did you mention Luis Patino by any chance? It looks like he is at the Tigers yeah. next week. Yep. I mentioned Patino. Yep. Cool. So I would be cool with that one. Uh, and then Luke Weaver. He's facing the Rangers. I just thought I would bring him up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that a is that a yes or no? No. <laughs> All right. We'll see. We'll take a wait and see approach with uh, Luke Weaver. All right. So I know that you have the top hitter matchups for next week, Scott. So let's talk that out and then figure out some hitters uh, that we like that are on those teams. So who you got? Okay. So the best hitter matchups are the Royals, the Orioles, the Blue Jays, the Rangers, and the Reds. But there are a lot of good hitter matchups this week, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those where the convention of having a top five probably doesn't do it justice because, you know, the Braves have good matchups, the Indians, the Tigers, the Dodgers, the Pirates, the Giants, the Mariners. It's, there's a lot of hitters we could choose from on these teams. Um, but I will point out the two with eight games because of a double hitter, a d double header next Saturday. Uh, are the the Orioles the and the Blue Jays? There you go. Yep, Orioles and the Blue Jays, who are second and third in my top hitter matchups. All right, so between those two teams, uh, Anthony Santander, I would imagine, is under 
seventy percent rostered, so he's probably someone that you could look at. And then uh, Toronto's a little bit tougher because <laughs> all of their awesome hitters are awesome and they're on everyone's team already. <laughs> but uh, I guess if you need a catcher, Alejandro Kirk's been playing more. Let's see who else they got here. Corey Dickerson, eh, he's kind of in a platoon role. Lourdes Gurriel, mm, he's, hey, you know, very quietly, Lourdes Gurriel's batting average has climbed up to 270. I noticed that the other day. So he's uh, maybe someone that you could look at there. You mentioned the Royals too. So Adalberto Mondesi, I'm telling you, man, it's going to be a big September. It could be a big week next week. I know he didn't play on Thursday. They gave him a day off after, you know, mm -hmm. knocking a shoe. So <laughs> great game for him there. Uh, what a, what other teams do we have here? Well, I mean, I'd I might look at Nicky Lopez for the Royals, particularly if you're trying to catch up stolen bases. Obviously, he's not going to provide much in the way of power, but he's he's been getting multi-hit games with some regularity. Okay. Um, Nick Solak is probably somebody to consider. He's been pretty hitting pretty well since returning from the minors. Sure has. You mentioned the Angels, right, Scott? I did not. Did nope. not. Nope. All right. A big swing and a miss here from Frank. And the Reds. You you did mention the Reds, right? I did mention the Reds, so that would have me look toward uh, Kyle Farmer. Yes. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's three lefties on the schedule, so that helps Farmer's case too. Okay. So I was going to bring up Tyler Naquin, but the lefty thing doesn't exactly work out well for him. He's right at 70% rostered. He had a really, really big month of August. So uh, assuming that Jesse Winker remains out, Naquin should play every game next week, even against the lefties. I like uh, I like Akil Badu, who just homered in for the second straight game on Thursday. The Tigers, I mentioned, they're not among the team, five teams with the best matchups, but they have good matchups, and five are against righties. So it might be the time to get Akil Badu active again. And, uh, hmm. Mm -hmm -hmm. AJ Pollock. I think he's a good start this week. Let's see what Pollock. I don't have a fully curated list yet, if, if it's not obvious. Oh, yeah, so I mean, we're, we're just, we're we're just kind of winging it here with the recommendations, but obviously for a well-defined list, you can, you can, you can check out, check it out on cbssports.com, the top 10 sleeper hitters for week 24. Yeah, it's a big week too. Uh, AJ Pollock, by the way, 75% rostered. So if you play in a shallower league, he could be available. Mm -hmm. But again, those teams, the, the Orioles, the Blue Jays are the ones that we're looking at, the Royals. Uh, so we we talked about all those. How about the teams with the five worst hitter matchups, Scott? Do you have those available? Yep, the Padres, Angels, Red Sox, Cardinals, and Marlins. So yeah, your your Angels are on the opposite end of the spectrum there, Frank. Ah, oh, my guy Brandon Marsh and his near forty percent strikeout rate will have to wait at least another week. So there you have it, the week twenty four pitcher and hitter planners presented by Line and Kugels. And if you're like me and you missed the summer already. It is cold here in New York. I went outside. I, I walked down to the corner store. It's it's like 65 degrees outside. I, I can't even go outside in shorts anymore. Anyway, no <laughs> fear. Line and Kugel Summer Shandy is here. It's this awesome blend of crisp beer and refreshing lemonade that fits perfectly when sitting in the backyard enjoying the weather or when watching a baseball game. And the Summer Shandy isn't all they offer. They also have their Session Hellas, which has all the flavor of a crisp German style beer, and it's only 99 calories. Let's not forget about their Lemon Haze IPA, a well balanced hazy IPA that blends hops with delicious lemonade. So, no matter what type of beverage you're craving, Line and Kugels has you covered. Just head on over to Liney.com. That's L E I N I E.com, or follow Line and Kugels or Instagram on Instagram or Facebook for more information about all of the delicious beers that they brew. Let's take a quick break. When we return, starter sit, Aaron Nola. What is going on? All right, so let's talk about him. Aaron Nola at the Washington Nationals. Supposed to be a good start at this point in the season, right? They trade away most of their players, except Juan Soto, who absolutely crushed Aaron Nola in this game. Four innings, six hits, six runs, five strikeouts. He allowed two more home runs, eight more hard hit balls. The ERA is now up to 4.54 for Aaron Nola. Even with that, I, look, it, it's old at this point. It's September. How much are we going to hold on to this? Each of his FIP, XFIP, and expected ERA 
are all under 3.60 for the season. I don't really get it. There are seasons where this can happen for where a player is just luck, unlucky the entire season. It's it's not fair to Aaron Nola. I think that he's performed better than the re, the overall results that he has this season. But we've seen this happen before. It was, you know, Marcelo Zuna a couple of years ago. He underperformed his stat cast numbers for an entire season. And then he was a buy low the next year. And then he had like a near MVP season. So it just it just happens this way sometimes. It's weird. I don't really know how else to explain it, Scott. But Aaron Nola is in line for two starts next week versus the Rockies at the Brewers. And there could be a lot on the line if we're in our head-to-head playoffs, you know, uh, yeah. you know, destroying ratios right now. Do you actually start them there? Oh, yeah. Yep. No hesitation. And All those right. matchups are good. The Rockies especially. Uh, at, and and at the Brewers. The, at, at the Brewers, eh, kind of Yeah, I mean, it's not as good of a matchup as it used to be, but it's between that and the Rocky start, it's it's a really favorable two-start slate for Aaron Nola. And even if it wasn't, like, I'm going down the ship, going down with the ship with this guy because there's no reason why he should continue to have starts like this. I, I mean, he did allow two home runs in this one, and that that is the one thing I can point to. Okay, his fly ball rate is up, his home run rate is up maybe that explains why the ERA is a little bloated, but doesn't fully explain it because he gave up six earned runs. Only three were on those two home runs, you know? Um, But another thing to keep in mind too is it hasn't, it hasn't been all bad for Aaron Nola. The previous two starts were great. Five of the last eight have been great. Now one was only four innings because it got rained out. So, you know, that was disappointing. But it was against the Dodgers, and he had struck out seven in those four shutout innings. I believe they were shutout innings. He was, he was off to a great start. So um, five of the last eight, not as great as they could have been, but more or less great. So, you know, if, if he's doing it at least half the time, I mean, how many starting pitchers do you trust to do well more regularly than that? They're, they're having... They're, there have been a lot of implosions among the most high end pitchers lately. I I just don't think I just don't think there's much upside to sitting Aaron Nola, particularly in a two star week. Yeah, I mean it's it's tough to say with Aaron. Nola. I think it's all relative to where he was drafted, right, Scott? So I mean, chances are if you drafted Aaron Nola where he was going in second, third round, he's your S one. I mean, you might not even be in the fantasy playoffs right now. If we're, if we're just being completely honest, maybe you got lucky and you picked up a Logan Webb or Shane McClanahan along the way, something like that. And you know, your your pitching your pitching staff has bounced back because of that. But yeah, I, I think a lot of the the disappointment in him is just where he was drafted, obviously. So, oh, I I totally get the disappointment. I'm not saying you don't have a right to be disappointed, but I I think sitting him now compounds that disappointment. All right, let's talk about Eduardo Rodriguez. He was at Tampa on Thursday. Six shutout with six strikeouts to just one walk. He had 14 swinging strikes on 94 pitches. He went fastball and changeup heavy in this start. And over his last six starts in particular for Erod, 2.73 ERA, 35 strikeouts over 33 innings pitched. But, I mean, it's been a roller coaster ride here, Scott. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, I mean, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call him, but... I, I mean, he's been so up and down this year where he goes through these stretches where once you start to buy back in, you put him in your lineup and then he gets like rocked for his next three starts. And then you take him out, performs well for the next three or four, you get him back in and, and then it's just, it's up and down all year. So, uh, Erod is still 84% rostered. He's at home next week against Tampa Bay. Once again, would you start him there? I mean, I don't think it's must start. But I, I think it's at least worth considering. I mean, I, I wouldn't sit a stud for him. I wouldn't sit Aranola for him, obviously. Um, yeah. I, I'm hoping, and it has been an up and down season for Eduardo R- Rodriguez. Eduardo, not Edward. Yeah. Eduardo Rodriguez has been an up and down season. But I'm hoping XFIP is finally having the last laugh here because despite his 488 ERA on the season, 344 xFIP. I mean, that's pretty good. You, you not a, not many discrepancies between ERA and xFIP bigger than that. 
Yeah, I, he's a lot like Aaron Nola in that way, right? I mean, obviously, we were drafting Nola a lot higher than we were Eduardo Rodriguez, but uh, those are two names that we've talked about all year where, hey, trust the underlying numbers. They're going to come around, and, and it just it hasn't really happened. But um, Erod, last six starts, he has looked much better. So uh, it's worth mentioning, in three starts against Tampa, he has a 2.63 ERA this season. Again, that is Eduardo Rodriguez. Carlos Carrasco, he went up against the Marlins on Thursday. Five and a third, three runs. He had five strikeouts, 12 swinging strikes on 82 pitches. And if the schedule that I saw is correct, it looks like he lines up for two starts next week against the Yankees and at the Marlins. Would you start Carrasco there? I would. Yep. I think... uh... Just a little shy of must start in my two start pitcher rankings for the upcoming week, but he he leads the he's the top name in the next category down for must start. So pretty much everybody's going to be starting Carlos Carrasco with those two matchups. All right, let's talk about some offense again. We had a pair of sock socks and shoes. Yeah, that would make more sense. Socks and shoes. Socks and Soto shoes. Went, Both feet went three for four with his twenty third home run and his eighth steal of the season. Juan Soto's awesome. We don't have to talk about him. Charlie Blackman went two for four, 11th home run, third steal. On the season, he's batting 267, 751 OPS. We haven't talked about Blackman in a while, and we were kind of waiting for him to come around. It, it, it's clear it's not going to happen this year, and yeah, he's 35 years old, so I think we're just we're kind of hitting that point in Charlie. Yeah, Blackman's it's probably career. not going to happen again. Yeah. But uh, I, I thought it was interesting. His, his strikeout rate is 13%. It's a career best, but it also comes with a 49% ground ball rate, which is also a career high. So, you know, it, it helps yeah. he's putting the ball in play, but not that it's on the ground, obviously. Yeah, he could still be a pretty good contact hitter, but the power is... I don't think the power is coming back. Now, it would have been easy to say that about Joey Votto prior to this year. But Joey Votto's a really special case. So, yeah, I'm not holding out hope for Blackman in the future. All right. Where should we add these hitters? You already mentioned Akil Badu has a home run in back-to-back games. He's 54% rostered, likely to be on your sleeper hitters for next week. And does that mean that you would consider adding him in a 12-team points league? Three outfielders for Badu? If I needed an outfielder, yeah, I mean... Just by the nature that only 36 outfielders are starting, maybe about 40 when you consider the ones in a utility spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's likely you don't need a sleeper outfielder, but if you do, yeah, Akil Badu, someone you could look to. Would you rather have Akil Badu or Ian Happ, who went two for six, hit his 18th home run of the season, and in August he had seven homers and 856 OPS? Again, that's Ian Happ. Yeah, Ian Happ was one of my sleeper hitters for this past week because the Cubs matchups were so good, but they are not good for this upcoming week. And the strikeout rate was still huge for Happ in August, so I don't have a lot of faith in him anyway. Like, I have more faith in Frank Schwindel and even Rafael Ortega and Patrick Wisdom, for that matter, than I do in Ian Happ. So you would take Badu over him? Yes. All right, let's talk about Odubel Herrera. He went three for five with a walk and a run score on Thursday. I didn't realize this. He had a pretty big August. 341 batting average, six homers, one seal for Odubel Herrera. 19% rostered, seven games next week. The problem that I have seen is that he's only started five of the last eight games for the Phillies, which I don't really get because Hmm. splits against lefties are pretty good. So... Uh, where would you look to add Odubel Herrera if anywhere, Scott? He's only 19% rostered. Hmm. Maybe some five outfielder leagues, but yeah, I hadn't noticed that the playing time had been spotty for him after that big August. You know, obviously off to a good start here in September with the three hit game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like the you mentioned they have seven games, uh, but their matchups are merely so so. So I don't, I don't think. I don't think Odubel Herrera is a big recommendation for this upcoming week. All right, so some maybe some deeper five outfielder leagues, which I think will probably be the case for a few of these other names. Lane Thomas went two for five with his first home run of the season. Since joining the Washington Nationals, it's 15 games. 
He is batting 314. He's let off in five straight. He's 1% rostered, and he has seven games next week. That is Lane Thomas. Where should we add him, Scott? Hmm. Really, really deep roto leagues. <laughs> Still batting barely over 200 for the year. You want to know how widely available he is? He is 99%. Uh, <laughs> he is available in your 24 team dynasty league. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Now, that's only a three outfielder league, yeah. but still not surprising. All right, so the deepest of leagues on Lane Thomas. Eric Lauer was at the Giants. Seven innings pitched, one run, only four strikeouts. It was his first quality start since July 9th. He's Ooh. 21% rostered, and he's up against the Phillies next week. Should we add Eric Lauer anywhere? His ERA whip and strikeout rate are actually pretty good. Not great, but pretty good. Um, but yeah, if he's not, I, I think his previous three outings were all less than five innings, much less short of six. So it still seems like a pretty low end option. All right. Well, if you thought we went deep for Lane Thomas, how about Yu Chang, who plays for Cleveland? His last 15 games, he's batting 327 with five home runs. It also helps that he only plays against left handed pitching. It, well, it hurts that he only plays against left handed pitching. Well, it yep. helps numbers. It, it doesn't help <laughs> us with playing. Time. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. But it, I think it. I think it makes it so there's no reason to bother with Yu Chang. All right. AL only people out there. I'm, I'm sure Yu Chang's probably uh, already rostered in those leagues. Some Thursday leftovers I wanted to mention. Sandy Alcantara at the Mets. Not his best here. Six and a third, four runs, six strikeouts. He got hit hard. He gave up 11 hard hit balls in this one. He's at home against the Mets again next week. I'm assuming we leave Alcantara in the lineup. Oh, yeah. I mean, his... Previous four starts were as good of a four start stretch, I would guess, as any pitcher has had all year. So, yeah, this is this is this this one Thursday is not a disqualifier by any means. Mitch Keller brought a smile to my face. I'm still rooting for you, Mitch Keller. He was up against the Cubs, six shutout, six hits, eight strikeouts to zero walks. It was nice to see easily his best start of the season. That brings his ERA down to. 6.23 <laughs> Keller. Uh, he's 9% rostered. I don't think you need to add him anywhere. Let's see where it goes. He's still just 25 years old, so I'm rooting for you, Mitch Keller. Anything, Scott? Uh, no, I'm no. Basically, two of his last three starts have been good, but then he had a seven earned run outing in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's not really a sandwich you want to be a part of. Rafael Ortega went two for five with his ninth home run. He slowed down a bit recently, but he's still leading off for the Cubs, and you know they, they have some hotter bats behind him, so there'll, there'll be some stuff for Rafael Ortega. Adam Duvall went one for four with his 30th home run, the quietest 30 home runs I've ever seen in baseball. I mean, it's like, Barely talk about him. He just goes out, does his thing. Adam Duvall, boom, yeah. runs. And his RBI total is shockingly high, too, considering he's with the Marlins for most of this year. Yeah, I, uh, I think it was him and Jesus Aguilar who basically drove in all of the Marlins' runs this season. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Their, their offense is one of the worst, and yet they were both not too, just a few weeks ago, right before the trade deadline, they were both among the NL leaders in RBI. Uh, in fact, they may have been one and two. It was crazy. Anyway, yeah, Duvall being only 70% rostered, I would say he's a sleeper hitter for next week. Given the Braves matchup, they have in six games, the Nationals and the, and the Marlins on the slate, but they're missing Alcantara. So, yeah, there's pretty good matchups for the Braves. If I am looking at this correctly, let's see. I believe that Jesus Aguilar still leads the National League with 92 RBI this season. <laughs> and Adam Duvall is number two with 88. Oh, so they're currently one and two. That's awesome. <laughs> that is crazy, man. Yeah. Is, wow. Uh, I did want to bring up, uh, did you mention Jorge Soler? I'm sorry, I was like zoned out there. Uh, I did not. Okay, he went two for five with his 22nd home run. He It was his ninth home run with the Braves in just 29 games. So Solaire, he's, he's coming around. He's 79% rostered, so it's there's a good chance he's not available in your league. Uh, do you believe, you know, obviously you're very close with the Braves. Do you believe that Duvall and Solaire are locks to play every night, um, even uh, with 
Eddie Rosario and, and Jock Peterson now there? Well, Lox is a little strong. I mean, they've each gotten a day off since Rosario came off the IL. Uh, let me see. Is it just one day off? Yeah. Yeah, they've each gotten a day off. Mm-hmm. And Peterson's gotten a day off. Huh? Uh, they, well, they're managing to mix it up pretty well. Hmm. Four outfielders. Uh, I would say the outfielders who are going to play the most of that foursome are Jorge Soler and Adam Duvall. Will it be literally every day? Probably not, but I don't think it'll, I don't think their playing time will be interrupted enough for you to worry about it too much. Brendan Rogers went two for four. He now has multiple hits in three of his last four games. We, we keep telling you add add Brendan Rogers. If you can Tuki Toussaint could not survive Coors field and his return to the rotation, three innings pitch, five runs. Four of those were earned. He is 56% rostered home versus the nationals next week. Would that warrant sleeper designation for Tuki Toussaint? Uh, hmm. I'm not, I don't have him as lining up against the national. I'll have to look into that again, but uh, I, I think that's a stretch. I think that's a stretch. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, call to the pen. We'll wrap up here. Some bullpen updates. We do have some streamers. And of course, we'll answer a few of your email questions. Let's start off with Oakland. Sergio Romo picked up his second save and he now has two of the last three saves for the Oakland A's. And he faced two, three, and four in the lineup. Andrew Chafin was used for the four outs leading up to Sergio Romo. So in the seventh and the eighth there, interesting. Uh, Lou Trevino still not being used. I know that there was, I saw an update that he was going to be available for this one. So I think he's dealing with some kind of slight injury right now. Lou Trevino is. Yeah, I mean, they haven't, when when they said they were going to take a break from him, they, they haven't used him at all since then. So yeah, he's dealing with a back injury. Apparently he's okay. September 1st, the news was he's dealing with back spasms. And then on Thursday, it said likely available to pitch Thursday. But they had a save opportunity, and they didn't go to him. So uh, Sergio Romo in deeper leagues, I picked him up in a 15-team Roto League where I am very desperate for saves. For the Mets, Edwin Diaz got his 28th save of the season. Having a really strong season, I didn't realize he was that good because I don't have any Edwin Diaz, but he's, (laughs) um, he's been mostly good. For mm-hmm. Cleveland, Emmanuel Class A gave up a run but did pick up his 20th save. For the Cubs, Rowan Wick came on for the save in the ninth inning. He gave up two runs. Only one of those was earned, and it tied the game. The Cubs did wind up winning in extras. And for Boston, Garrett Richards, a three-inning save. One hit, one walk, four strikeouts. He allow- He's allowed just one earned run over 10 and a third innings since being moved to the bullpen. And... uh he has two of these three inning saves already since being shifted there. So, I mean, it's not really something that you can count on, but he's pitching well. I mean, for the deepest AL only category leagues, Garrett Richards is the name there. To stream or not to stream, let's start with Friday. Steven Brault at the Cubs. Alec Mills versus the Pirates. Nestor Cortez versus the Orioles. Glenn Otto at the Angels. And Glenn Tyler- Otto. What'd you say? What was the jingle? I've got to pick pull up the phone. Oh, wait. Are you going to play the sound or am I going to sing it again? 1 800 Glenn Otto. Come on. <laughs> pick up the phone. The call is free. I love that. That, that is great. Yeah. Uh, and then Tyler Anderson at the Diamondbacks. Uh, yeah. So Nestor Cortez against the Orioles is my favorite. And Hernandez and Otto. At the, you know what? Tyler Anderson at, at the Diamondbacks. That's, that's probably my second favorite. Yeah, so I didn't mention Carlos Hernandez because I, I think there's some. It's like up in the air if he's going to start Friday or Saturday. Right? Oh now. yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yep. I, I mean, he would be in consideration. It's a tougher matchup against the White Sox, but he's pitching very well. Carlos Hernandez. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alec Mills is someone I am also starting in a 15 team roto league. So cross your fingers, everybody. Saturday, Ew. Saturday to stream or not to stream. Tanner Houck versus Cleveland. Ranger Suarez at the Marlins. Ronaldo Lopez at the Royals. Carlos Hernandez. I, I wrote him on both of these lists. That's hilarious. On both mm-hmm. Friday and Saturday. All right. Forget about Carlos Hernandez. Adrian Hauser versus the Cardinals and Tyler McGill at the Nationals. Ranger Suarez at Miami. 
Yeah. Danger Ranger. It's going to strike again. Uh, Tyler McGill at Washington is fine. And Reynaldo Lopez at KC is okay. Sunday, Luis Patino versus the Twins. Eliezer Hernandez versus the Phillies. Daniel Lynch versus the White Sox. So I was trying to think how that lines up for next week, but I, I can't figure it out right now. Zach Davies <laughs> versus the Pirates. Tyler Gilbert versus the Mariners. And Taylor Hearn at the Angels. Okay, so let's go with Patino against the Twins. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't really I don't really want any of the others. I agree. Maybe Elia, uh, Eliezer Hernandez against the Phillies if you have to. All right. Yeah, I'm right there with you. We're going to wrap up this week with emails because there was no fantasy justice. If you do have anything going on in your league, with your commissioners, rules, whatever's going on, make sure to send us in your questions and put fantasy justice in the subject line. This one's from Bill, and he's addressing you, Scott White. You've helped me to a couple of championships, so I believe in you, especially down the stretch. Pick two for next week. Fran Mill Reyes, CJ Crone, Frank Schwindel, Connor Joe, and Enrique Hernandez. Okay, two for next week. Let's start with the matchups. So Cleveland has the best matchups of the players on those teams. So Fran Mel Reyes, I think, would be the easy choice there. Uh, we don't know when Enrique Hernandez is back from COVID, right? So that's pretty easy to eliminate. They are hoping it's this weekend. Yeah, and the Red Sox have bad matchups anyway. The Rockies, are they don't have the best matchups, but... Half of the week is in Colorado, and it's seven games. So as hot as C.J. Crone has been, I think he would be the other choice. So for ML Reyes and C.J. Crone. Yeah, I'm right there with you. This one's from David. I play in a 10-team head-to-head points league, and I'm in a three-way fight for first. I'd like to stream Tristan McKenzie next week, but I'm not sure who I should drop. I was debating dropping Montas, Chris Flexen, Shane McClanahan, or Michael Brantley. Please do not drop Montas or Shane McClanahan. Uh, <laughs> who's been... Uh, Michael Brantley, who's been sitting on my bench for most of the year. But you, Darvish, has the worst record recently. For reference, my pitching staff is Chris Sale, Robbie Ray, Charlie Morton, Joe Musgrove, you, Darvish, Frankie Montas, Chris Flexen, Shane McClanahan. So I'm a strong pitching staff, shallow league. I could understand maybe you won't have reason to start Darvish again this year, but maybe you will. And as I said on multiple times on yesterday's show, you don't want a weapon like that falling into the wrong hands. So. Drop Chris Flexen. I don't think he's actually good. No. And then you don't have to worry about him him blowing up in, in your hands. Don't, don't be mean to Chris Flexen. <laughs> yeah. he, he's had a pretty good year. He's Speaking better than me. <laughs> that, you know what's so funny? You bring that up. So, like, whenever my friends have criticism for athletes, like, whatever, we have a bunch of group chats, we talk smack, and they'll say, oh, oh this guy stinks. I'm like, he's better than you. <laughs> so, what do you have to say about that so, i mean lots of people think i stink that's that's fine now nah, i i tend to think that you have pretty good hygiene scott so I oh well you. you've you've never been in the same room as me <laughs> frank <laughs> oh, <laughs> you man. have no idea you know I, I was considering yeah I'm, I'm thinking about where i should move next i currently live in new york city I, i'm considering south florida but well i don't know scott i mean if maybe. you're stinky, maybe I shouldn't move to Florida. Well, the way I said that made it sound like I was implying that, right? Like, no, I, I'm just saying you'd have no idea whether I have good hygiene or not. I mean, I looked, I true. look well kempt, I guess. Yeah, but uh, you don't know. You have no idea. That, that's I, I like to think I do, but who knows? You that's know, no, that's not that's not something many people are going to tell you. Oh, you s- smell like onions or whatever. <laughs> You know, <laughs> oh man, stay away from the BO. This last one's from Matt, longtime listener, and love the work and views. Well, thank you. I am in a decade long home keeper league with friends from high school that has evolved into a strong collection of managers from across the country. We recently voted and migrated to a new fantasy platform that has Shohei Otani as one player, where with daily lineup settings can be started as a pitcher or hitter, but not both on a given day. Several of the managers feel like this has created a unique, non-replicable cheat code in owning Shohei Otani that creates an extra roster spot effectively and flexibility not provided to your average pitcher in the National League who does accumulate hitting stats. 
Given the league allows four keepers, the manager with Otani could be benefiting for years to come. He is currently in first place with a decent lead. No surprise there. How would you propose the league handles this or is this just a fact we all have to agree with? My idea was to force the manager to pick hitter or pitcher per week to use or use two keeper spots on him to dilute the huge advantage that Otani brings the manager. Again, daily lineup, head-to-head categories league with a regular season and playoffs. I think that this is a really good topic of conversation and something for next year where if anyone has ideas on how we should handle Otani, Send them in. Email us, fantasybaseball at cbsi.com. I, I think that he's such a unique player, and we're still like very early in the process of trying to figure out what we should do with Otani. On CBS, he's one player. If you play in a weekly league, you have to decide if you want to use him as a pitcher or a hitter for that given week. And honestly, Scott, it sucks. It sucks, man. In my opinion, because... And I'm not saying... Because there's other platforms that do it too. I have him on NFBC in, in my main event league, my most important league. And I, I have none of his pitching production in my lineup this entire season. It's hard to complain because, you know, as a hitter, he's, you know, an MVP just as a hitter as well. But it's frustrating. It's frustrating that, like, I get none of this production, none of his pitcher production, this historic season, and it's out the window. I get none of it. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm frustrated. I, I think we need to figure out how, do, how to approach Otani better for fantasy. Well, it sounds like what you're campaigning for is to make him more impactful when Matt here wants to make him less impactful. So, (laughs) so so it's interesting because he's painting it from that perspective, obviously someone who's going up against a player in that format where you can reap all of the benefits of Mm Otani. And I'm telling you my perspective as someone who's only getting half of his production. And again, it's really, really good production. So it's hard to complain about what he's done as a, as a hitter, but in a 15 team league, I would love to have Otani's pitching stats in my in my lineup. You know, maybe mm-hmm. I wouldn't be in the middle of the pack if that was the case, right? In pitching. So it mm-hmm. sucks. It just sucks. It does. Yeah. Um so what's really made it more difficult is that he's become so good, <laughs> right? <laughs> like to to address the email here. Like everybody knew this was possible for Otani and they could have drafted him instead. They didn't when his value was low. And so, you know, I kind of feel like the guy who had the foresight and, and was the most willing to to take a chance on Otani have meeting his best case outcome should reap the benefits. And if that makes him the most valuable player in the format, so be it. I mean, he's our he may be the most valuable player in real life, you know? Um but he, if you're getting all of his pitching stats and all of his hitting stats, he's an even more valuable player in fantasy than he is in real life because he's also just taking up one lineup spot. It's not just the one roster spot. It's the one lineup spot that you're getting pitching and hitting stats from. And so that's, you know, obviously the Angels, real life, they're having to set a different lineup every day. You know, they don't get that the benefit isn't quite as big as it is in fantasy. Uh, So I, I don't, I don't know that it's fair to get everything. I don't know. I mean, it's, it was like moving mountains. I know just to tell you from like an internal perspective, I was, I was very much in the conversation on this when Otani was first being introduced to the player pool and what should we do with them? And ultimately the path we took was the one I proposed. Um, so I kind of have a stake in it, I guess, because of that. You know, we we heard the easy solution would be make two Otanis. And that's what a lot of other sites did. And I'm just like, no, I mean, we need to... We need to give this unique player his due and make it so you could get pitching or hitting stats from him, not knowing which side he'd be better at, you know? Um but it didn't really even come up that you'd get both. Cause I, I think part of the problem was there was, Oh, well then it wouldn't be fit. You need, you'd need to get all the hitting stats from every other pitcher that like, right. Any player. And, and we see position players pitch. Sometimes any player you, you should be getting all of their hitting stats and all of the pitching stats. If we're going to do that for Otani. And yeah. that's probably true. Um, now that the DH is presumably coming to the NL next year, that it's less of an issue. Right. So I don't know. It's still, 
it's it's uh it's fraught the discussion yeah. is fraught but that's why i think we should open it up right like let's let's talk about this like let's make a forum send us in your ideas and i don't know maybe we just do an off-season podcast where we like that's just a large portion of the podcast is like trying to figure out what to do with otani because i think it's it's still a very unique situation for a very unique player um specifically for this situation that what is this gentleman matt emailed in about yeah i, I think making the manager who has Otani here use two keeper spots on him of his four. I think that, I think that makes sense. I mean, Otani's he's pitching like a top 30 starting pitcher and you know, he's, yeah, a, he's I don't, a, I don't think that's fair. That's not fair. That's yeah. not, that's too much of a pen. Like there, there shouldn't be a penalty, but he is you a cheat code though. He, he is a cheat code. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Like if you, yeah, that's it. You're just yeah. I, no. I, I th he's he's a cheat code in real life too. I do think, as I said, it's more value, even more valuable in fantasy than in real life. But everybody knew it was a possibility, and they didn't take advantage of it. I I definitely don't think it's fair to use two keeper spots because maybe you don't. Maybe it's not worth it at that point. You know. Mm -hmm. That's um, true. And 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 like that would really stink as the guy who invested in Otani. Um, I could I could see the other solution more, having him declare for the full week whether he's going to be a pitcher or hitter. Then it then it becomes no. He, o, Otani's value ends up being the same as it is in a weekly league, no. which is still very high. I hate it. Well, it's better than using two keeper spots on them. <laughs> yeah, and and those are the only options that we're presented with. I'm sorry, Matt. I feel like we we didn't really help you out much here. It's it's a good conversation to have about Otani, but uh, between the two, I, I lean towards using two keeper spots on him. Scott Scott is against that, but if it's just these two options, I, I like being able to. I mean, that's a huge keeper. penalty. Keeper spots are so precious, and to have one, yeah. one used up on two players, like. Yeah, I, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair at all. I hear you. I mean, look, I, I don't think that there is a perfect answer for this. So uh, the the conversation rolls on regarding Shohei Otani. Let's wrap there, man. We we ran a little bit long here. <laughs> all right, I mean, look, I, I'm passionate about this Otani thing. I want to figure it out. I want to. I, I kind of want to make CBS like the forefront for you know how to use Otani. And I don't know if it's gonna. It would require a lot of work behind the scenes to make it happen. I don't even know if it's realistic. Trust me, it was. <laughs> I was surprised that we got him set up this way because apparently it was a programming nightmare. But yeah, yeah, uh, we got to figure it out. All right, let's start there. <laughs> Scott, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again on Monday. Bye bye. <laughs>